Good evening, everyone. So as Bill said, my presentation this evening is entitled Crossing Musical Cultures, Mary Oyer and Expanding Social Conscience in Mennonite Music. So for North American Mennonites, the 20th century was a time of renegotiating the relationship between the church and the world. The two kingdom theology that had allowed them to turn inward and ignore external culture up to that point was being challenged by economic and social forces and Mennonites had to confront the world around them in new ways. It's no surprise that music, a field where theology and culture overlapped, became a location for heated debate about the church's future, nor that those debates provide us with a unique view into shifting Mennonite self-perception during this time. Mary Oyer, who is the most important figure in 20th century Mennonite music, provides an important insight into this set of dynamics. So my thesis, what I'm arguing in this paper, is that Oyer participated on varying sides of conflicts that emerged in Mennonite music over race, gender, denominational affiliation, and theology throughout her career, pushing for transformation and clinging to tradition. And her life demonstrates the tensions and contradictions inherent in the 20th century Mennonite experience of social conscience, of expanding social conscience as expressed in music. So before we really get started in earnest, I want to provide us with a little bit of social and musical context for this story. So the two main groups that we're going to be talking about are the Mennonite Church, which I'll call MCs, and they're a group with Swiss heritage and a strong tradition of cultural separatism, including things like plain dress. And we're also going to be talking about the General Conference Mennonite Church, or the GCs. And they're a mostly Dutch Russian strand of more recent immigrants to North America with less separatist history. And that would be the branch of Mennonites um, that are most common here in Kansas. So in the first half of the century, Mennonites had to confront their identity in new ways. They faced two world wars and they collaborated with the US government to create civilian public service, which was an alternative service program for conscientious objectors to war. And this solidified non-resistance and service as core aspects of Mennonite identity. Mennonites also found some important sources of identity in their worship practices, especially in music. Mennonites always emphasized simplicity in worship. And when they immigrated to the United States, their music consisted of unison a cappella hymn singing. The GCs introduced choirs, instruments, and four-part harmony when they formed in the 19th century. And by the 1890s, most MCs had adopted four-part harmony as well, but choirs and instruments remained taboo. Four-part singing gradually disappeared in most Protestant groups, but it remained part of Mennonite worship. And by the 1940s, it was a distinctive Mennonite tradition and an important symbol of identity. Mennonites also had to face the question of gospel songs, tunes which emerged during the revival movements of the 19th century. These songs included dotted eighth note rhythms and refrains. This would be tunes like Blessed Assurance, which some of you might know. And so most leaders believed that these musical innovations might be emotionally appealing, but they were inappropriate for Mennonite worship. They obscured the resolve necessary to maintain Christian ethics in life. And so most leaders opposed their inclusion in worship services. And they also represented, represented fundamentalism. Uh, when several fundamentalist Mennonite leaders pushed for the inclusion of 150 gospel songs in the 1927 church hymnal, this led to quite a bit of debate and difficulty within the church. So by the 1950s, Mennonites were experiencing an identity crisis. Many young people had been exposed to the outside world during the war in alternative service. Congregations were becoming more aware of the civil rights movement and leaders were pushing for greater witness to the state. Core aspects of separatist identity were being called into question. And one important symptom of this crisis was growing fears about encroaching musical trends from outside and the loss of the singing tradition. So both MCs and GCs started discussing the possibility of creating new hymnals, in part to strengthen this tradition. And slowly, the collaboration that produced the 1969 Mennonite hymnal was born. The conflicts that emerged during this attempt to create a unified musical identity reflected and became flashpoints for these broader and larger issues of identity. So now we're going to discuss the production of the Mennonite hymnal and the boundaries of Mennonite identity. So when hymnal work began in the late 1950s, Mary Oyer was a member of the faculty at Goshen College, an MC institution in Indiana. 
She had attended Goshen as a music major, where she graduated in 1944, and then she began teaching at the college the next year, while she pursued graduate degrees in cello at the University of Michigan. Oyer joined the Hymnal Revision Project in 1959, where she played a pivotal role. Along the way, she participated in conflicts and changes related to MCGC differences, ecumenicism, gender, and theology. And we're going to briefly go through each of these topics. So one of the biggest points of contention between MCs and GCs at the beginning of this process was musical instruments. Instruments were old hat for GCs, but most MC leaders still opposed them, fearing that they would endanger the four-part a cappella tradition. Instruments presented such a problem because they symbolized growing threats to separatism, including individualism and professionalization among Mennonites. There was a lot of fear and anger directed at these changes, but that fear is best understood as a proxy for larger and more nebulous shifts that were harder to address. The committee members received letters conflating things like plain dress and education levels with four-part harmony, and people lamented many of the changes that they observed in their communities. A broader mistrust of the arts, which appeared individualistic and distracting from Christian community, also fed this opposition to instruments. And many MC committee members feared that if collaboration with the GCs led to the acceptance of instruments, some congregations would leave the denomination altogether. So in the face of all of these worries about instruments, Oyer was a continual advocate for their value in Mennonite worship. Her efforts weren't always greeted kindly, and one colleague went so far as to say, quote, I just don't see how Mary Oyer can play the cello and be a Christian, end quote. <laughs> but throughout this all, she continued to advocate tirelessly. Ultimately, the committee was able to recommend preserving the Mennonite vocal tradition while being open to the use of instruments in individual congregations. They created a hymnal acceptable to both constituencies. And MCs did not embrace instruments in the 60s, but they didn't condemn them either. As a major advocate, Oyer played a huge role in shifting MCs toward accepting them. And this placed her on the forefront of introducing external culture into Mennonite life and uniting MCs and GCs during this period. These two groups also had different hymnities that had to be reconciled. Oyer supervised all of the research on texts and tunes, and she conducted most of it herself. And she intentionally sought out music from both traditions. During her work on the hymnal, she also became interested in restoring original source material. This provided a common base for the committee to work from, and it made changes more palatable to both groups. She played an indispensable role in making that solution possible. But the largest problem remained the treatment of gospel songs. Many leaders were still hostile to them, but they were too popular among the constituencies of the hymnal not to be included. Problems appeared in the outline. Should gospel songs be set apart in their own section, which was true of the GC Mennonite hymnary from 1940, or should they be integrated based on textual themes? This sparked an incredibly heated debate that signaled the depth of denominational tensions. So Lester Hostetler, the project's editor, a GC, created his own outline. He kind of went rogue after the committee had made a decision and decided to segregate gospel songs. Oyer felt he was ignoring MC interests, and there was a large debate involving the chair of the committee. And finally, they were able to move ahead when the committee decided to integrate all hymns except for gospel songs and choral hymns. So the project was able to move successfully ahead, but this episode demonstrates some of the deep conflicts that took place as these two groups attempted to bring their traditions together and to balance power. Aside from these intra Mennonite interactions, a growing ecumenicism was also visible, in part because of Oyer. She opened new doors for Mennonites as the first Mennonite to receive a doctorate in music. And her research on source material connected her to a larger scholarly conversation about Protestant church music. She also made efforts to expand the Mennonite musical palette. She included Anabaptist, Lutheran, and Calvinist hymnody, as well as Gregorian chant in the book. And this ecumenicism, which came at a time when Mennonites were questioning their relationship to other denominations would have been impossible without her hard work. Oyer also challenged the church to accept greater roles for women. She was a highly visible instrumentalist and the only woman on the hymnal committee at a time when women were mostly confined to children's ministries. She was the project's executive secretary, which gave her a huge amount of influence over the book. And when the book was released, she traveled to congregations to help them make sense of it. She became the best known figure in Mennonite music, something that had never been true of a woman before. 
but she also met with opposition and disrespect. When the Mennonite Publishing House was tasked with introducing the book to the MCs at their 1969 meeting in Turner, Oregon, they were hesitant to give Oyer the assignment and distrustful of her public speaking abilities, despite the fact that she had been working as a professor and lecturing for over 25 years by this point. And so we can see that music and gender were an important forum where she was pushing these boundaries of identity and of inclusion. Now the hymnal was not only a point of contention over the direction of the church, it was also a short source of shared identity amid sharp theological differences. Most lay MCs were wary of social activism and they clashed with a growing group of young people who were troubled by the church's cooperation with the government. Tensions came to a head at the 1969 meeting in Turner, the same meeting where Oyer introduced the hymnal. Young activists took the floor of the convention and asked delegates to recognize draft resistance as legitimate witness to the state. This led to tense deliberations that afternoon and that evening Oyer introduced the new hymnal and she led the group in congregational singing. To conclude the session, she chose number 606, an obscure setting of the doxology which became a hit and acted as a kind of theme song for the rest of the week, later embedding itself deeply into Mennonite consciousness. After the tension of the afternoon, where delegates argued over the proper practice of non-resistance, a fundamental piece of their identity, they latched onto this song that tapped into their four-part tradition and brought them together. Monday morning, an amended report accepting draft resistance as an option for Mennonite men passed with opposition, and people on both sides of the conflict expressed reconciliation. Things had been patched over, but the Mennonite church was undeniably changing. And music was both a forum to debate Mennonite identity and a source of unification in the face of these shifts. Now, I do want to touch a bit on race here at the end of this section. So throughout the 1960s, Mennonites were beginning to confront the civil rights movement, but most of them were unwilling to get deeply involved in such a political struggle. The Mennonite hymnal made a few attempts to cross racial boundaries. It included six non-Western hymns and a few African-American spirituals but many of the committee members were hesitant about these styles. Despite the hymnal's wild success, Oyer favored revisions immediately in order to expand some of these identity issues within the hymnal. And she too was beginning a process of change in her musical understanding, something which would shape her work and the church in the coming years. So now we're going to discuss the supplements of the 70s and 80s and the increasing pace of change. So during the 70s and the 80s, Oyer was deeply involved in changes in Mennonite music, surrounding cross-cultural music and external American culture. However, as the pace of change increased, these shifts began to move beyond her comfort zone. And this demonstrated some of the tensions presented by the growing incorporation of mainstream culture into Mennonite life. This began when she first traveled to Africa in 1969. She began studying African church music and she lived in several locations, including Kenya and Tanzania, for a total of five years during the 70s and 80s. Over time, her idea of good church music became more relative, and her exposure to anthropological aspects of music making brought her into the field of ethnomusicology. She transferred this new understanding to American Mennonite congregations. She was a major contributor to supplemental songbooks for the Mennonite hymnal during this period. These collections represented a widening of Mennonite music featuring Asian, African, and indigenous hymns, spirituals, and Spanish texts. Throughout this period, she was a near constant committee member, consultant, and song leader in the process of creating and launching these supplemental books. And she also traveled to individual congregations teaching cross-cultural music. Many of these pieces were outside the comfort zones of most North American Mennonites. But by teaching it, she made it accessible in the context of their congregational singing, increasing intercultural awareness within the church, and expanding North American Mennonites' understanding of their identity, so that it now included a broader global community. Her work remains one of the most important contributions to cross-cultural Mennonite music. The 70s also saw a growing acceptance of external musical trends from the dominant American culture in keeping with the gradual disappearance of cultural separatism among Mennonites. So this included guitar accompanied unison music, as well as the acceptance of black traditions in MC worship meetings. North American Mennonite music now included more external cultural expressions than ever before, 
Boyer's early advocacy for instruments and her role in introducing the church to these broader musical considerations laid crucial groundwork for these developments. The 80s also saw the emergence of conversations about inclusive language on issues of both race and gender, again taking cues from mainstream American society. And Oyer played an important role in changing language, language and supplements of the 80s. But she would not always be at the forefront of this issue, something we're going to return to a bit later. And while Oyer was a crucial force in causing these changes in the church's musical culture, she did not embrace every change. And the difficulties of this process can be seen in her relationship with Goshen College during this period. So Oyer was moving beyond classical music, but at the same time, the college was increasingly orienting itself toward training classical performers. She felt she no longer fit in an institution that was trying to become like a conservatory and that her voice wasn't being heard. At the same time, many women on campus were advocating for feminist causes and often expect Oyer, expected Oyer to be on board but she was not interested in taking on a feminist agenda. Like many older faculty members, Oyer believed that women's issues were obscuring some more central issues of identity and direction. And she felt increasingly out of step with the feminist movement at Goshen. And so taken together, all of these issues made the 80s a tense period in her relationship with the college. She ultimately decided to step down from the institution in 1987 at the age of 65, after she had been there for a total of 42 years. She was still pushing Mennonite identity to expand, but she was also a person with traditions that she valued. And like Mennonites who had sought to maintain separatism and four-part singing earlier in the century, Oyer now struggled as she watched the beliefs that she valued appear to wane. While she holds a great deal of love for Goshen, the tensions wrought by cultural engagement came to the forefront during this period. And that's a theme that would also appear in her work on the next Mennonite hymnal. So now we're going to get to Hymnal of Worship Book and the Legacy of Cultural Integration. So in the early 80s, MCs and GCs started talking about the possibility of creating a new hymnal. After successfully collaborating on the Mennonite Hymnal, this seemed like a natural course of action. But the project met its share fair of conflicts, fair share of conflicts, sorry, and Oyer's role in the process through the tensions that accompanied the changing church into sharp relief. So, Immediately, processes became cumbersome. This was in part because lines of communication and authority were unclear, but also because of the divisiveness of inclusive language, especially changing pronouns for church members and for God. Oyer originally chaired the group, but she stepped down when she took a sabbatical from Goshen in Kenya in 1985. This was in part because she felt unable to manage these difficulties, but she remained on the music committee. In 1986, she agreed to take on a paid position as project manager, but her actual tasks remained unclear when she returned from Africa in 1987. So this lack of structure posed particular problems for inclusive language. There were communication issues that exacerbated these tensions, and despite a policy created to, clar to clarify them, the issues continued to mount. Oyer felt that inclusive language was overshadowing other concerns, mostly historical context and she believed it was becoming a license to change other textual elements and devalue original material. Because a return to historical context had been her entry into hymnody 30 years earlier, this new approach was difficult for her. While many people, both committee members and constituents, were passionate about the immediate expansion of inclusive language, others opposed any change at all. A new hymnal would have to serve both poles of the spectrum and everywhere in between. Some viewed Oyer's attitudes as rigid and outdated, but she represented a real constituency the hymnal was supposed to serve, and she certainly didn't oppose all change. But this contention continued to grow. And the tipping point was controversy over Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, known as 606 for its number in the Mennonite hymnal. Since Oyer had introduced it in 1969, it embedded itself into Mennonite consciousness, and there was no question it would be included in the new book. But despite a covenant not to touch the hymn in any way, the text committee treated this one like any other and began suggesting language changes. This deepened divisions and led to a lack of trust. For Oyer, attempts to change this hymn were just the last straw in a series of frustrations and difficulties. She wrote to denominational leaders with several concerns which she felt were ignored, and she became embroiled in conflict with other committee members, which she did not always manage well. In 1989, she stepped down from her work on the hymnal. Oyer had shaped Mennonite hymnody as it reflected a changing church, but she now found herself out of place in it. However, 
Her role did not disappear after she stepped down. She continued teaching music in congregations during this period, and committee members kept her informed of their work. Eventually, when Hymnal of Worship Book was released in 1992, Boyer was able to support it, and she traveled to congregations plugging the book. Her approval was utterly essential to its success. She was still the most important figure in Mennonite music. And even though she left the project, her influence was clear in the hymnal source tracing, which drew on her work as its model, and her pioneering work with cross-cultural hymns, which had made them accessible in congregational contexts, and which provided much of the material included in the new book. But this saga demonstrates some of the tensions inherent in the 20th century process of incorporating external culture into Mennonite life. The same complex processes that can be observed in the changing church as a whole took place within individuals, and they're well encapsulated in Oyer's experience. For much of her career, she was a progressive firebrand on the fronts of instrumental and cross-cultural music and greater roles for women in the Mennonite church. However, she was also a product of a specific time. And by the late 80s, the church she had invested so much of her life in began to move away from her. It's no surprise that such a transition is deeply painful. Hymnal Worship Book was also the culmination of the musical aspect of cultural integration for the church as a whole, and it resolved several questions that had emerged in the Mennonite hymnal. Declining separatism did not mean the demise of Mennonite distinctiveness, and in the same way, four-part a cappella singing remained a vibrant part of Mennonite worship, despite the growing popularity of accompanied in unison music. American Mennonites had also become increasingly aware of other cultures since the 60s, and their hymnal became one of the clearest locations where they incorporated those traditions into their worship. This new book featured an expansive group of cross-cultural hymns, which American Mennonites were actually comfortable using, demonstrating a marked change from the release of the Mennonite hymnal. Finally, Mennonites, both MC and GC, now understood themselves based on shared commitments to peace and justice, which this new book took as a bedrock theme. With Working for Justice now integrated into the Mennonite ethos, Hymnal a Worship Book represented this new consensus and the decline of separatism-based divisions, laying the groundwork for the MCGC merger that occurred in 1995 and the church's new direction. So to conclude tonight, Oyer pushed boundaries of Mennonite musical identity, and she drove many of the changes I've described, even those that extended beyond her comfort level. After the hymnal's publication, she continued traveling, teaching, and learning, and her influence continues today. Voices Together, the hymnal released in 2020 by Mennonite Church USA and Mennonite Church Canada, which encompassed the former MCs and GCs, continues traditions she established while also moving in new directions. Its wealth of cross-cultural music clearly bears her mark, and the acceptance of Christian rock songs can be traced to her advocacy for openness to new traditions, which has borne increasing fruit over time. The book also includes gender-neutral pronouns and feminine images for God, continuing the inclusive language that began in the supplements of the 80s. This has led to some discomfort for many of the reasons Oyer raised in the 80s, but today at age 99, she has joyfully accepted voices together and she spends time singing from it every day. The process of musical and cultural change for 20th century Mennonites represented both growth and loss. Oyer saw the church change drastically during her lifetime and she sought to expand Mennonite identity while preserving tradition, two desires that sometimes conflicted. Her changing relationship to Mennonite music over the course of her career reveals the complexities and tensions that North American Mennonites faced as they navigated their identity in a changing world. And her experience and actions continue to shape Mennonite music today. And before I open it up for questions, there are a few people that I have to thank. Um, number one, to the Eureka Committee for funding this project and making this possible. To Dr. Kip Weedle, my advisor on this project, and Dr. Mark Jansen, my major advisor, who both were incredibly helpful. To a couple of archivists, our very own John Thiessen, as well as Jason Kaufman and Joe Springer. And to Rebecca Slough and Mary Oyer herself, both of whom graciously met with me and shared some of their experiences. And then to Jared and Annie for organizing this and putting it together. Thank you so much.